Revelation 7, 14, the text tells us, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. May the Lord has a special blessing upon his word as we study today. Let's pray together as we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit once more. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace that now we have come into the sacred hour of this day, the sacred Holy Sabbath. And Lord, we pray and we ask as we approach the throne of grace that you would please help us and teach us today to understand your word better. May you give us clarity of thoughts and as well as the Holy Spirit to teach us what it is that you want to uh, help us and teach us to learn today. And as for me, Father, I ask, I really have nothing to give. I have nothing to offer except the sinful heart, sinful vessel that I am. And so I ask that you please use me as your mouthpiece today. Speak through me, I pray. Cover me with the blood of Jesus. And so that he may be seen, I ask. In the loving name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> A Michigan judge, his name is Judge Raymond Vaught, or Vaught, I don't know how you say that, but they call it Vaught. And so he has a policy in his courtroom that he forbids people using electronic devices in his courtroom. Vaught sets the bar high and said that because cell phones are destruction and there is a very serious business going on while the court is in hearing, the court is a special place and the community needs a little bit more respect during the court hearing. So anyone whose phone rings aloud uh, during the court session, he confiscate it and then they would receive a fine. This is his practice for many years. Over the years, attorney, police officers, witnesses, spectators alike have broken the rule and received their punishment. Everyone. And so, during a closing argument at the trial, someone's smartphone was going off. And it started talking very loud. I'm sorry, Ron, I know you <laughs> earlier, but this is just a story, okay? Um, so during the closing argument, someone's smartphone started going off. And it was Judge Raymond Vaught's new cell phone. <laughs> and so during the break, during the break of the trials, Judge Vaught held himself in contempt and paid the standard $25 that, finds, that he finds everybody else who break the rule inside his courtroom. You know, Judge is a human, he said. Vaught said, they, they're, not allowed, they're not above the laws. He said, and I have broken it, and I have to live by it. And so he held himself in contempt and just like everybody else who broke the law inside that courtroom, he too held himself in contempt. You know, Judge Vaught's action tells us that he has integrity, he has good character, and that he is also responsible, just the same way as everybody is responsible. You see, friends, to live a pleasing life for God, we need to have character that stand in the last day. Amen. A character that is definitely and wanting and lacking in these last days. A character that a lot of people lack and a lot of people would just brush it off because it applies to someone else and it does not apply to me. But God is not without a representation. God is not without a representative in the last days. He will have a group of people. He will have people in the last day that will have character that stands. The book of Revelation tells us a group of that last day that talks about who has character and integrity. And so please turn with me into the book of Revelation chapter 7. We're going to be reading verses 9 through 14. Revelation 7 verses 9 through 14. So please open your Bible there. Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 14. 
And if you're ready to study, let me hear by saying amen. amen. Revelation 7, 9 through 14, the Bible says, And after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongue, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and, and palms in their hands. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and stood the eld and, and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and, and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered and said, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white. In the blood of the Lamb. Here we find a group of people in the last day. They call great multitude. Now in the same chapter of Revelation chapter 7 verses 4 through 8. Talks about the sealed 144,000. And so today we're not going to argue whether the 144,000 or uh, their symbolic or literal number. I know there's enough argument out there. And I don't like to get into argument about that. But however, what we need to know is their character and their lifestyle. And that they live a life worthy for God. They have a character to stand. You know, there are two views out there in the world. The 144,000, some people say it's a literal and some say it's symbolic. Also, the two views out there in the world, the 144,000 is separate or together, or it's the same group as the great multitude. Really, my aim today is not trying to argue whether they're literal or symbolic. That is irrelevant to the fact that God has a group of people in the last day. Amen? So my aim is not to prove whether whose side is right, but rather to find out a little bit more about this group and why are they living and why, how did they make it through the great tribulation. You see, friends, in my own personal observation, I learned a lot and quite a bit about the 144,000 and the great multitude. And so on the surface, the great multitude seems like a very distinct group from the 144,000. But if we look a little bit closer, we're going to find out a little bit more information on the 144,000 and the great multitude. Remember that the first group is described as what we call the 12 symbolic tribe of Israel. And then we find the great multitude, later on, it said that they cannot be counted. And so they are from every tribe, nation, tongue, and people. However, there are a few things to consider before we jump into some kind of conclusion, whether it's literal, symbolic, the same group or not, just to give us a little bit of idea. Every time we study the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation, John uses a special type of techniques of literary when he write the books of Revelation or the writings of Revelation. The literary technique that he used is that at one point John hears an event and then the next thing he sees that same event is described. And this is actually written throughout the book of Revelation. That's how the book of Revelation is written. The Bible said that John heard an event. And then he would turn around and God would show him that same event. And then he would see that same event. And so that's what the technique that we were going to look at a little bit. And so we're going to find out here just a couple examples from the book of Revelation of what John sees versus what John heard. All right. By the way, what John heard and what John sees, it's the same thing. It's the same event. And we're going to give you a little bit of example throughout the book of Revelation. I'll give you just a few. The Bible says in chapter 1, right, John hears a loud voice and it sounded like a trumpet. What kind of a voice? A trumpet. That's what John heard at first. And then he turned around and God showed him the same view 
And then John sees that it was not a trumpet. It was the what? It was the voice of Jesus himself. It was Jesus himself speaking. So what he hears and what he sees is totally different things. What he hears sounds like a trumpet, but what he sees is what? It's actually literally Jesus speaking, but it's the same what? Event. It's the same thing. All right? And so the second thing that we're going to look at is uh, John hears with the lion of the tribe of Judah who, who has overcome. And then when John looked and he sees, what did he see? Instead of the lion, he sees what? The lamb. So are they the same thing? Yes. He hears, right, the roars of the lion. But when he sees, it was a meek lamb, Jesus Christ. So what he hears is what? The same thing as what he sees. Just give you a little bit of description of what he hears and what he sees. And then the next part is that John heard the number of the seal. They're called the tribe of Israel. We know that the tribe of Israel doesn't exist anymore, right? In fact, when John wrote this, there's only two tribes that was left, Judah and Benjamin. The rest of the northern tribe, they were not in existence historically. It was simply a theological, symbolic Israel that he, heard, he hears. And then, when John looked, it's in the same chapter, right? John heard the 144,000 being sealed, and then when John sees, he sees the great multitude. It's interesting. So we're going to go a little bit on that. That's what, this is what I'm saying. I'm not going to argue with it literal or symbolic, same group or what, but I'm just giving you my observation from the passages that we are looking at. And then we find that John hears of the great prostitute sitting on many waters. But John, when he looks, he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast. All right? So he's hearing the same thing as what he is seeing, but it's just in a different literary technique that he's writing. And of course, finally, uh, John hears of the bride, the wife of the Lamb, described there in Revelation 21. And then, when John looked, what did he see? John sees the what? The holy city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven to earth. And so, these are some of the examples that we find in the book of Revelation. There are a couple more, but just, you know, just to give you a little bit of idea about what's happening in the book of Revelation. So is it clear that sometimes what John hears and what he sees, they're the same event, it's just given a little bit of different description. And so these are some of my observations as I go through the study of the book of Revelation. So the 144,000 are sealed, but what about the great multitude? Now we find Revelation 7.4 tells us that they are sealed, the 144,000, but it has no mention of the great multitude being sealed. Remember that the sealing is a very important aspect of the last day, right? It means you, are all, you, are, you belong to God, you are saved, and you are protected. That's what the sealing is all about in our previous study, right? And so if the 144,000 are sealed and there's no mentioning of the great multitude being sealed, then we might have a problem. Amen? And so this is why what John sees or what he heard, the 144,000, and what he sees is the great multitude. And so it's a very important aspect of our study. So friend, why is it important to be sealed? Because we know from our previous study, I've, I've already told you, I'm going to give you a little bit here, just writing it down for you so you can take notes. To be sealed means you belong to what? belong to God, right? The Lord has purchased us, and He now, we belong to Him because He sealed us. We've done this in our previous study, so I'm just giving you a little bit of review. To be sealed means you are what? You are safe. Amen? Now we're going to find out today a little bit about uh, that. What does that mean, to be sealed? Um, to be sealed means you are protected. Remember the plague, the great tribulation that's coming upon the earth? Only those who are sealed will make it through the time of trouble. And we're going to find out more on that. And so, remember friends, 
Whether it's literal or symbolic, that's not the point. The point is they have a character that stand in the last day. And they are sealed because of their commitment for the Lord. Well, notice what Ellen White tells us a little bit about this group. There was a question during the days of Ellen White. There was pastors or some leaders who have written articles and wrote to Ellen White. And they said they were arguing about the 144,000 and whether it was literal or symbolic. Uh, one leader have, re- have written and said, my question is to you, Ellen White, is, is the 144,000 made up of mostly Americans? <laughs> That's what the question was. Was the 144,000 made up of Americans? Because, you know, this was a great argument. And today, we, people still argue about that, right? And so, Ellen White says, I have no light on the subject. And then people come and say, well, it's, it's this group or that group, or we are the one, or they're the one, or uh, they say, oh, well, it's uh, literal or symbolic. But actually, when you read through Ellen White's biography, he's, you know, the, he has a statement that seems like literal. He has sta- she has a statement that seems like symbolic. And then she comes up and said, I have no light on the subject. She said, upon hearing the letter, it's a very... <laughs> Delicate time in which we are living, a time when we must individually cling to the Lord with all the powers of our being. And then she continued, those who urge, listen to Shea, those who urge theories regarding matters that are not revealed are what? Placing themselves where they are in what? In peril of meeting with disappointments. Friend, that is why the Bible says, when it describes about the 144,000, it says the tribe of Israel, but don't, that's not literal Israel. Amen? Remember, the Old Testament Israel no longer exists. But then in the New Testament, we have a new Israel. His name is Jesus Christ. And he has 12 disciples, and he has people all around the world. That's why the great multitude, it said that they come from tribe, every kindred, tribe, tongues, and people. They are not a specific race. They are what you call the human race. God's people who love him from every walks of life. Amen? So let's be careful when we talk about the 144,000, the, they are literal or symbolic, or this or that, because we are in great peril, she says, when we come up with our own theories, which are not revealed to us. Amen? Amen? So when we study, we just go back and learn from what God says. You see, friends, whether it's literal or symbolic, that is not a salvation issue. Are you following? That's not a salvation issue. The point is, how do the 144,000 or the 144,000 and the great multitude live their lives? That's the most important question that we should be arguing about. And we should be talking about, amen? Not literal or symbolic. Because a lot of time, friend, we spend so much time arguing about literal or symbolic that at the end of the day, we ended up not liking each other. Amen? But if we talk about how they live their life, we can encourage and say, I want to be just like that. What about you, brother? What about you, sister? I want to be just like that. Amen? So the 144,000, the great multitude, John heard the number, 144,000, and when he sees... They're actually a great multitude. A closer look into 144,000 will give us a little bit of idea what is taking place in this scene. Amen? Remember that the 144,000 and the great multitude, they are shown in different time of history. One shown in earth and one shown in heaven. All right? And so the 144,000... Just like the Old Testament, God's end time Israel is no longer a literal Israel. There are evangelicals who claim that the, the, the end time Israel is going to be made up of the literal Israel. They know that. They, they actually talk about that. But it's a deception. Because we know the children of Israel no longer exist as far as the tribe historically. And so the, the, the 144,000 of the end time great multitude, we know that it's a spiritual Israel. 
So Israel as a nation was administratively organized into a tribal unit in the Old Testament. And then in a time of war, listen, in a time of war, the army was organized into a military unit of a thousand with its subunits. The only time, and you guys, I want, you, I want you guys to get this. Any time, the only time Israel was numbered in the Old Testament is when they are preparing for war. When are they numbered? When there is something, an urgency that's about to take place to fight in a battle. The 144,000 is numbered because they are about to go through a time of trouble. All right? Then, a thousand was a basic military unit in the ancient Israel known as what we call the battalions of Israel. Or they are the people who would go into battle. Now, the 144,000 who are sealed saints are portrayed as organized army under the leadership of Jesus, and they are about to face one of the most harshest or the only harshest trouble the world has ever experienced, known as the great time of tribulation or trouble. Amen? So the reason why they're numbered, again, literal symbolic, that's not my, 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 uh, my topic today. But the only time they're numbered in the Old Testament, as well as here, is because they are about to face a war that the world has ever seen. And then the 144,000 stands for the totality of God's faithful time followers in Israel, spiritual Israel. They are about to engage in the greatest battle of all, the history of this planet, the Great Tribulation. All right? So is this clear? Are we, are we getting a little bit more information about this group? And why is it important? And why were they numbered? All right? Now, what's interesting, friends, these two observations that I find is this. Number one, the 144,000, to me, when I study, from my own personal observation, they look like a sim group. John, John hears, and then he sees. All right? We find that throughout the book of Revelation. And by the way, if you have another idea, that's fine with me, too. I, have no, uh, I, can, I can live with that, however you want to do that. Um, here's the interesting part. The 144,000 are described because of the sealing. They are described as 144,000 because they are about to go through a what? A, sea, a war. A spiritual warfare that will take place in the last day. That was on earth. But in heaven, in the same chapter, they are described as the great multitude that went through the what? The great time of trouble. It's interesting when you find that. And so, in the Old Testament, right, the counting, the numbering of Israel when they go into battle in the New Testament, spiritual Israel is, begin, is about to go to a war, so they are counted or numbered, preparing for the spiritual warfare. Again, whether the number is literal or symbolic is irrelevant to the fact that God will have a people that will go through the great tribulation. And then in heaven, the second part, they pass through the great tribulation, and now they are in the kingdom of heaven. They are saved at last. There is no need to count. Amen? In heaven, there's no need to count. Why? They have already passed the great tribulation. In seeing the great multitude, John tells us that they are from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue. And if the 144,000, it does not give us description except that they are spiritual Israel, they must have come from every kindred, nation, tribe, and tongue. Amen? So, just as the Old Testament Israel was transferred to the New Testament Israel, Jesus Christ, so this numbering of the tribe is a symbolic description of the followers of Christ. The 144,000, as we know, Ellen White says, that they are the church militant, Standing on the great tribulation, ready to wage war. But in heaven, they are referred to as the one coming out of the great tribulation or the great multitude. You see, God's faithful people no longer organize in heaven into a military unit. But what? They are portrayed as a rejoicing crowd, returning from battle, celebrating the triumph of victory. The same Old Testament the same way Old Testament Israel was organized into military during war, but when the war is over, they're no longer 
numbered. They are now returning to celebrate a triumphal victory, just like this great multitude. So friends, here's a little thing that I want you to take notes. When you compare the great multitude and the 144,000, they are very similar and the same. Notice, uh, this is from your own observation. You won't find it anywhere else. Just look at it. The 144,000 in chapter 14 versus chapter 7, okay? And by the way, these are the only places where you find the 144,000. Chapter 7 and chapter what? 14. The 144,000 stood on Mount Zion with who? With the Lamb. What about the great multitude? They stood before the what? The throne and the Lamb. That's the same description, isn't it? Amen? So the 144,000, the great multitude, they all stood before the Lamb. The, in, that's in Mount Zion. Amen? There is no other Zion except the Zion of God. Right? Except we have a little Zion in our midst. Amen? That's his name. Beautiful name. And then we find that the 144,000 were redeemed from the what? From the earth. If they're redeemed from the earth, they must have gone through what? Great tribulation. And then the great multitude have, won, have gone through what? The great tribulation. This is my observation from studying them. And then the 144,000 were what? Were not defiled by what? But pure. The great multitude have what? They have washed their what? Their robes and made them white in the what? The blood of the Lamb, or they are pure. We see the similarity between the two. And then we find that the what? The 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever he, he goes. The great multitude serve God day and night. That's following God wherever he goes. Amen? So we see here the two groups. It seems like they're separate, but in reality, they are almost the same group. And then we find that the 144,000 are what? Singing the what? The song to God, the song of Moses and the Lamb, the song that no one else has experienced, it says. The great multitude are praising God and the what? And the Lamb. Over and over again, I find the similarity. So friends, from my own personal observation, we find that the 144,000 is counted because they are preparing for the war. And then the great multitude had came out of that war. They are no longer counted. Why? Because they have now made it through the great time of trouble. Amen? And so, again, whether you believe literal or symbolic, that's up to you. I'm not going to argue with you about that. Amen? But, who are this group anyway? Why is it important, friends, about their character? Revelation 7, 9. The Bible tells us about this group. I give you a lot of information there. And so, that's a lot of technical information. Now, let's go to more practical information. After this, the Bible said, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robe and palm in their hands. Notice this. The great multitude, the Bible says, are people from every walks of life who gave their heart to Jesus. They are from all nations. They are from all kindreds. They are from all people and all tongues. They are made up of different race, ethnicity, color, and languages. People from around the world, a worldwide movement. There is no superiority in their, in their color or their race because they are all equal in the sight of God. Amen? This right here tells us that no one is above another. For God is not a respecter of a person. Whether you are American or if you're black, white, yellow, green, or whatever color you are, you are God's people. Amen? So, put your race aside and instead accept the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? The question is that I want to ask, ask literally is not the number, the 
literal or symbolic, the question that I really want to ask is, how are they able to stand before the throne? That's really the main question that I want to ask. How are they able to stand before the throne of God? Amen? How are the 144,000 able to stand? The Bible said that they are clothed with what? White robes. And then they have a what? A palms in their hand. That's what the text tells us. You see, friends, both white robes and palm branches are a symbol of triumph and victory over sin. It's a symbol. In the ancient times, generals and soldiers after the war who had won had, are celebrating and they are wearing white robes to celebrate and commemorate their victory in the battlefields. And so here we find that the great multitude, the 144,000, they are wearing a white robes and they had palm branches in their hand because they have come out of great tribulation. They have overcome by the grace of Jesus Christ. And friends, if you plan to make it, you're not going to make it because of your superiority. You're going to make it because of the grace of Jesus. That's it. We are going to make it only because of what Jesus has done. You see, friends, what we find is that they're having white robes and palm because they are celebrating. The celebration came at the end of their struggle of the great tribulation. The great tribulation that they all have gone through. Notice, friends, in Revelation 7, 14, describe the same people, but it described a little bit different. In verse 9, it said that they were, what, what, what do they have? They wear the what? White robes, and what do they have in their hand? Palm. Notice what verse 14 described a little bit about this group. They're no longer washing that robe, or they're no longer wearing that robe, but instead it says, notice this, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, These are they which, are, which came out of great tribulation, and what did he say? And have washed. Notice this, they have washed their robe. In verse 9, it said that they are wearing the what? The white robe, and they have palm branches in their hand. But in verse 14, they said that they are, what are they doing? They washed their robes and made them what? White in the blood of the Lamb. What's the difference? One is wearing a white. One, they have what? Washed that robe in the what? The blood of the Lamb, it was white because of the blood of the Lamb. You see, friends, when I look at this, it's very interesting because I've, I've sometimes, you know, I, I prick myself and I, I bleed a little bit and my white shirt doesn't turn into white. It just turns into blood. Amen? This is the best detergent that the universe has ever seen, a blood that can make you pure as white. The blood of Jesus. That's a miracle in itself, Amen? Because no matter how much spot you got in your life, the blood of Jesus, the best detergent the universe has ever known, Amen. will make you white and spotless. Amen? It will clear your life. And so friends, that's the best thing that we can ever do in our life. So the Bible says here, they are, these are they who came out of great tribulation. In other words, they receive, they receive the white robe. That's when you come out already. And palm branches... Already, they, they, they're, they're, they have come out of the great tribulation. But what does it mean when you are still washing? That means you are now what? You're not done yet, right? So they're not done yet. A person must go through a harsh trouble to have a wash and clean white robe in their life. They are clothed in white robes, but here it says they, are washed, they washed their robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What's the difference between the two? You see, friend, the washroom in the blood of the Lamb, the cloth in white is the final result of the washing of the robes. Amen? The washing of the robe is a metaphor, a metaphor for purification from uncleanness and from sin in the Old Testament. What did he do? In the Old Testament, a sinner or a person who had, had made a, a sin that person must bring a sacrifice. What do they have to bring? A sacrifice. It's an Old Testament language. A sinner must bring a sacrifice or sacrificial lamb as his offering. A sinner then kills that very lamb as his sin offering. 
And the blood of the animal will be a method of cleansing from sin from the sinner. Amen? Friends, it was a very painful process. A sacrifice must be made. A sinner is cleansed and forgiveness is given. And there's cleansing that takes place when the sacrifice is offered. When a sinner is finally washed and clean because only of the blood of the animal. And friends, we know that that sacrifice is none other than Jesus. The point is there. The point is that in order for us to be cleansed, there must be a willing victim. There must be a willing sacrifice. Amen. And friends, the willing victim is Jesus Christ. The reason why the 144,000, the great multitude, made it through the time of trouble is because of the sacrifice of Jesus. You will not go or make it any other way except the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb, Jesus Christ, was the ultimate sacrifice. His blood became a means for us to be white. And friend, the only way for the 144,000 to make it is because of Jesus' sacrifice. Without it, they will not make it through the time of trouble. It doesn't matter how good or how well they think they have lived their life. If they do not have the blood of Christ, they will not make it through. In other words, before the time of trouble, God's people must have or already apply the blood of the Lamb in their lives. Why is that? You see, when the great tribulation comes, God's people must be sealed. And the sealing entails that they have made a full commitment to God. There is no turning back now. And the sealing, friends, the sealing basically tells us that the tribulation is about to happen. Notice what Revelation 7, 4 says. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, speaking of the same group. And there were sealed a hundred and what? Forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. In other words, God's people are sealed. And then after this same verse, the next verse later on uh, in verse 9, it said, and then the great tribulation came. You notice that? Verse 4, it said that they are sealed. And then verse 14 and verse 7, I mean, so verse 9, it said that now, these are they which came out of great tribulation. In other words, you cannot go through the time of trouble without being sealed. This is a very important uh, lesson to take from because the time of great tribulation will arrive when God's people are sealed. So when the great tribulation happens, there is no time to prepare. The people have already made up their minds and they are either for or against Jesus. How do we know that? Because Revelation 22 tells us, verse 11 and 12, He who is unjust, in the context, by the way, friends, of before the time of trouble, right? He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And notice the context in verse 12. After he said, you have made your decision, verse 12, he said, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. What is that describing? The what? The second coming. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So, the time of trouble begins when Jesus makes the pronouncement in heaven. What did he do? This is the solemn announcement. The, the world, the universe will hear. Jesus stops his work of representing his blood on behalf of confessing sinners for everyone who has made their final decision. Before the great tribulation, people have already made up their mind. The Bible said, he who is unjust and filthy will stay that way. And he who is righteous and holy will stay that way. And friends, Jesus will come. The great tribulation will take place just before the arrival of Jesus. And the 144,000, the great multitude, <clears throat> they are described as going through such a time of trouble. Now, let's talk a little bit about the time of trouble before we close here. Some people, 
are afraid of this word, time of trouble, or the great tribulation. In fact, they're so afraid that some people have come up with the idea that when the tribulation comes, I will be raptured secretly. That's how scared people are. I'm serious. Out of, out of their fear, they came up with this secret rapture theory. Because they said, nobody is going to go through that. Right? Because of that, people come up with different theory to prove their point that they are really scared. So friends, there is no need to be afraid of the time of trouble. There are people who are so worried about the time of trouble that they are robbed of their peace currently. Let me just share with you some practical tidbit before we close about the time of trouble and what can we do to prepare for the great tribulation. You see, friend, there are people who think that in order for us to prepare for the time of trouble, you must live as a hermit. You know that? There are people who think that in order for us to, 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 to live or to prepare for the coming of Jesus, the time of trouble, they are detached from society. They live alone, no contact with society whatsoever. Friends, you're not preparing for the time of trouble. You're living in fear and confusion. And so you're, you're out there and living by yourself. Now, friends, I am, I am all for country living, and I love the South because we have a lot of country life, right? But friends, Ellen White tells us, country living is good for God's people in the last day. Amen? We agree? And I say the same, uh, same thing, I agree. But friends, I am for Christian country living. I am for that. But country living, listen now. Country living without witnessing is just simply country living, not Christian country living. Country living is nothing more, nothing less, if you are not witnessing for Jesus Christ. Amen? You know why? During the pandemic, people in the world realized that the city is not a safe place to live. And what did they do? They lived to the country. But they're not Christians. So they're not doing Christian country living. They're just doing country living. But we, as God's people, we are to do Christian country living. You are supposed to what? Witness for Jesus when you are in the country. And this is in preparation for the great time of trouble. So friends, I have no problem with the country living when you are witnessing for Jesus. In fact, I want to live in the country too. Amen? My, my, it, by the way, it's better for the kids, better for the environment. Better for all of us. But if you live there, don't want to have contact with anybody, you're not living a country living. You are living in fear. Amen? Because we know that uh, Elijah and, and many of the prophets in the Bible, they live in the wilderness, but friend, they would go out and witness to the world. They were God's powerful prophets who witnessed for his second coming. You see, friends, I am talking about People who are so worried about the time of trouble that they neglect their present duties. All they talk about is a time of trouble and they become so paranoid that they are so worried that they lost track of their gift. And they no longer use their gift for the kingdom of heaven. That is not country living. That is paranoia. Amen? We need to know. That we are living in the last days. And I believe that with all my heart. But friends, we need to reach out to our friends and our families, to our neighbors. Amen? Amen. All they talk about is a time of trouble. They become so paranoid. But friends, they have so worried and they lost touch with reality. They're burying their gift. They're burying their talents. Just like the talents that Jesus told us about in parables. People in the last days who talk about time of trouble, sometimes they are so suspicious of, for, of, of everything that's taking place. They hear things here and there, and they're easily persuaded. I'm telling you. During this pandemic, there are so many conspiracies that came out. You can't even believe it. Adventists are buying into this kind of ideas. We know that Jesus is coming. I, have no I, can, I can tell you that. We know that. But friend, buying in into conspiracy is dangerous. 
Alan White told us that. You see, they are so busy thinking and talking about the time of trouble that they no longer realize, listen, that there is a work that needs to be done in sharing the good news. So busy being cut up with conspiracy theories that they no longer have common sense. And they can't even smile. I'm serious. I have talked to some of them. They're so scared of this pandemic. They're so scared of what the government is doing. Friend, the government will do what they like. But don't be in bondage of fear. You are being robbed of the peace that Jesus wants to give you. Jesus said, the peace I leave with you. The peace that the world doesn't have. And so tired of sometimes hearing of people talking about, oh man, this and that. Did you see? Did you see? Friends, I read the news. Amen. I read the story and I read, I read articles. But it doesn't bother me because I have, I'm all right. I'm, I have, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Amen. I'm living what I'm supposed to do. I'm sharing what I can. Why would I worry about what the government is doing? Amen? And by the way, the government is doing some shady stuff. Yeah, we know that around the world. The pandemic is shady, but friend, let's not get into conspiracy about it. Amen? Because control will come one day, and we know that. We study prophecy. We know exactly what's going to happen. And friends, the problem is we are so busy, we are so worried about what the papacy is doing or what the beast is doing that we lost sight of what the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is doing. Amen. Oh, have you heard the Pope and the world have met again? Yes, I have. I've read it. But have you heard what Jesus is doing? He's in the sanctuary. He's my Savior. And He's doing cleansing my life from all of my bad habits. Have you heard what Jesus is doing for you? Because, friend, the more we focus on the bad side of the event, we lose sight of what Jesus is doing. Yes, let's be aware of what the beast is doing, but more than the beast, let's be aware of what the lamb is doing. He's working on your behalf. Working for you in the sanctuary above. Study those lessons. Amen? Not those conspiracies. Get back into biblical study. Not hear say and hear what somebody said instead. Study the great controversy. Study last day events. Study spirit of prophecy. Study the Bible. You get too much TV and too much news and all they talk about is negative anyway. Amen? And at the end of the day, you became like the news. Bad news. Amen? No wonder we can't smile whenever God has done something great for somebody else. We can't rejoice when somebody is rejoicing because we love misery, love company. And sometimes as Christians, we are robbed of the peace that God has given us. I want to be practical this morning because I want to be just like Jesus. You see, friends, what's happening around us a lot of people, they're worried about the danger. But there is a danger, a little danger in their own backyard. They worry about the time of trouble and the great tribulation and what the beast and all everybody's doing. But they forget that there is a little trouble in your backyard. It's called your family. It's called your friends who are suffering. A family or a neighbor who is in pain. No one has visited them for a long time. There's a little trouble behind you and around you, but we're talking about, we're so busy about what everybody else is doing in the world. And we forget that there is a mother, a father, a son, a daughter who is suffering. You think you're preparing for the time of trouble? No, friends, you're paranoid. Think again. There is a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter who needs your prayer, who needs you to love them more than anything. 
Why is it sometimes we are so patient with the people in the world, but we are not patient with our own family? Right? It's true. We spend a great deal of giving Bible study and, and going out and sharing, but here we neglect our own backyard. It's sad, friends. It breaks my heart. You're not preparing for the time of trouble. You are living in neglect. Don't get the two confused. Amen? Don't get it confused. Conspiracies and all this, you're not preparing for the time of trouble. You're living in neglect of the needs of your family. Spend Bible study with your children, your family, your brother, your sister. Pray with them. That's what you should be doing, preparing for the time of trouble. The time of trouble will come whether you like it or not. But the question is, what are you doing to prepare for it? Brothers and sisters, we need to get back to reality. If you want to prepare for the great time of trouble, do not neglect your present duty. There are some who think that the great time of trouble is around the corner, and they said, I don't have to do anything for my family. And this is why society is crumbling. The churches are crumbling. You know that we have as much divorce in the church as much in the world? It's sad. It's sad. There are people, they said, well, the time of trouble is coming. I no longer need to study. I don't, know, I, I, need, I don't need to work. I don't need to go to school anymore. What's the point of preparing anyway? Because the time of trouble is around the corner. Friend, you are deceived. You are deceived. And people want to live in whatever they touch from everybody else because they said, man, when Jesus tells me I'm going to go to the mountain, I have the time to prepare. Friend, you're not living preparing for Jesus. You're preparing for some conspiracies. <laughs> they say, well, what's the use of all that money and education before because the time of trouble is coming anyway? Let me just give you what Jesus... What the, what Paul tells us, or what Jesus tells us, in fact. You know what Jesus said? Occupy till what? I come. That doesn't mean that you need, you need to work extra because, you know, you need more dollars or you need a bigger house. That's not what I meant. Jesus said, while we prepare for his coming, occupy till he comes. What does that mean? Do not neglect your present duty. You have work to do. You have a witnessing to do. Don't neglect those for the so-called time of trouble. And friends, there are people who quit their job and they, they said, I no longer need to work because I'm preparing for the time of trouble. You know, what, you know what the Bible says about those people? He said that anyone who does not provide for his need, the family's need is wor is, is, has left the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible says, friend. That's not my words. You know that? And there are some people who want to live in the charity of others because they are preparing for the time of trouble. And you know what they do? They said, don't send your tithe to the church. Don't send your tithe to the conference because they're not doing God's will. Send it to us. Send it to our ministry. We are doing God's will. And you know what they're doing? They're dividing the church. That's all they're doing. But they said, no, you can't send it to the church. You can't send it to the conference because they're doing something shady in there. You know, if Jesus was, was here, you know, when Jesus was here, he went to the synagogue. And you know who were shady? The leaders. He could read their hearts. And what would Jesus say? I'm not here for those leaders. I'm here because of my father. And friends, if you come and, and you want to be looking around and you're spying, oh yeah, they're doing something shady, you'll find it. But if you come because you love Jesus and I want to worship him, you'll get it too. Amen? And sometimes we get so caught up in all these things that we are losing our soul. We are losing our children. Yes, that's reality. Oh, friends, they claim all this nonsense. 
Jesus is coming. Don't work. Don't study. No need all of that. How are you going to provide for your family? How are you going to do that? They live in the charity of others, thinking they're preparing for the time of trouble. In fact, they said, I'm just going to live in a little tent. We have known people here. I'm going to live in a little tent so that when Jesus said, go to the mountains, I, then I can run. What about your family? What about your children that need milk? Come on, let's be practical, people. Amen? What about your grandchildren that need to be fed? Friends, sometimes I laugh when I hear things like this. No practicality whatsoever of the last day. Thinking we are preparing for the time of trouble. No, you're not. Don't get it mixed up. What they are doing is they live and eat in charity of others. You are not preparing for the time of trouble. You are living in laziness. Don't get the two mixed up. Amen. Don't get it mixed up. The question that I want to ask before we close is how do I know that I will make it to the time of trouble? How will I know that I'm ready for the time of trouble? And here, friend, before we close, this is a very important aspect of preparing for the time of trouble. Jesus tells us in Luke 16, verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is what? Least, little things. Is faithful in that what? Much bigger things. And he that is unjust in that which is what? Little things. Is what? Unjust also in much. Notice that. How prepared are you for the great tribulation? Every day God gives you little things to work on. Whether it's cleaning the toilet, fixing your bedroom, amen, fixing when you get up in the morning, washing those dishes, praying, studying the word, those are little things that we think are not important. But in the eyes of God, there is no non Essential. There is no thing that are such thing as little. Everything is counted in the sight of God. Amen. Everything is counted. The little things that you do is so important that those will prepare you for the time of trouble. You know why? Because if you are not faithful in doing these little things, guess what? You're not going to be faithful in bigger things. Amen. There's no need to be afraid of the bigger trouble ahead. The principle is do the little things. If God, listen now, if God can trust you with little trials, then friends, he will trust you with bigger trials. In fact, I want to rephrase this. If I had my way, I don't, but you know, I'm just, just me being me. I like to rephrase this. If you can trust God in your little tribulation, you will be able to trust him. In your bigger tribulation. Amen. It's the same thing. It just. I'm, I don't want to add to God's word. You know that's dangerous right. But I just like to come up with my own. If you can trust him in little things. You will be able to trust him in bigger things. God is trustworthy. And you can be certainly sure. That he is able to deliver you. What does that mean? What does that mean? To trust him. What does it mean to do the little things? The importance, Christ of the class, the importance of the little things is often underrated because they are small. But they supply much of the actual discipline of what? Of life. Teaching your kids to take out the trash, to, 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 to wipe the table. These are little things that we think doesn't matter. But friends, if a child does not have discipline, guess what? They will not have discipline when they grow up. Little things matter and little things count. There are really no non-essentials in the Christian's life. Our character building will be full of peril while we underrate the importance of the little things. Little things count. So friends, if I was to give you an advice, 
There is no need to worry about the time of trouble when you know you are faithful to God in little things. What are those little things we call in life? Your duty as a Christian. These little things that you do. Friends, when you have a little trouble, do you normally ask somebody for help right away or do you take it to the Lord in prayer? Those are little things. When you face financial economic hardship, are you still faithful in your giving? Those might be low, seem like little things, but those are big things in the eyes of God. Amen? When you are faced with the Sabbath work issue, do you say, oh, well, I'm just going to work, provide for my family because God will understand? Or do you say, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what? Amen? When you are faced with social pressure, do you stand up and say what you believe? These are little things that we might say today. When you are faced with peer pressure about either smoking, alcohol, drugs, do you say, you know, I'm going to try it? Or do you say no to our young people, right? Or when faced with a biblical diet issue of clean and unclean animals, do you say, well, I'm just going to eat it this time? Amen. Or here, 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 as we close. How are you at home versus how you are at church? Those are little things. You say, oh, the way I act at home is different from the way I act at church. You see, friends, we're, we're trying to be practical, amen? The way you deal with your family at home is the way you should deal with people outside. You love them. You care for them, amen? And sometimes, friends, Children know very well their parents. If they are mean to them at home and they're smiling at church, the kids know. Amen? Nobody else know better than anybody else than your family. Amen? This is why we must live a genuine lifestyle for Jesus. Little things matter. And friends, when you have lived your life for Jesus and you are faithful to Him, when there is bigger things that comes your way, God has even provision for that too. He said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is what? Common to man. But God is what? Faithful. faithful. I love that word. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to what? To bear it. When you have been faithful with little things, when trials come, the Lord will provide for you. He will find a way out. He will help you go through such time, such hardship in the last day. So friends, how prepared are you for the last day? How prepared are you for the time of trouble? My question is, have you been faithful in little things? Because if you have not, yes, you're not prepared. So today you need to start making preparation. Getting up in the morning, Lord, I give my heart to you. Here I am. Help me today to be your servant. Help me today to serve my wife. Help me today to serve my kids, to love them unconditionally. To love my neighbor as myself. Help me today. Those are preparation for the time of trouble. Not conspiracies. Not all this that we have talked about. You see, friends, God will not give you anything you can't handle. How are you prepared? Are you prepared for the time of trouble? The time of trouble will come. Trouble will come. It's only when you make little things count in life that, friends, God can count on you and bigger things ahead of you. My appeal to you is very simple. Give Him your little trouble and your little things that you think little, and I can guarantee you God will give you victory in greater trials ahead. So, if I was to say one thing about the time of trouble, the time of trouble will come. Yes, it will. And some will be caught unaware. But for those who have been faithful to God in the little things in life, they will make it through the time of trouble. Amen. Amen. 
you can trust Him. You can give your heart to Him today and say, Lord, right now I'm facing these little things in my life. I am giving it to you. Help me. Because this is our preparation for the time of trouble. Amen? How many of you want to say with me today, Lord, here's my heart. Take it. I give it to you. Help me with the little things in life. Help me to make it count. Help me to do it with a smile. And help me to do it for your own glory and your honor. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. As we prepare for the time of trouble, Lord, help me to do the present duty that you have given to us, to me, to each one of us. To be faithful in the little things that you have given us along the way. Because these are preparation for the bigger trials ahead. Help me, O oh God, to trust you in my finances. Help us to trust you in our finances. Help us to trust you in our little trouble, with our little family trouble, with our friendship trouble. All of this, Lord, when we have given it all to you and lay it at the altar, we know by your grace we will make it through the time of trouble. Bless us today. Bless your people. And help us, Lord, to be faithful in all that we do. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen.